So let's jump in and start with our first uh, unit here with just some basic introductory information, some definitions, and the rationale why we even should be planting churches. Well, here's a basic question to begin with. What's the church? Now, typically, we tend to think, well, the church is like the church I came from. And so when I go to plant a church, it's going to look pretty much like that church that I grew up in or uh, the church where I became a believer. Um, but we need to step back and think about this question a little bit. If we're going to plant churches, what really is essential and what's not? Because many times there's traditions or, or uh, features of the church that you came from that are very good and very effective and, and you appreciate them, but they may not fit in a new community. They may not be something that new believers in a new community you're trying to reach that they can relate to. In fact, there might be some things that are, are very inefficient and offensive. Or you might be trying to create something that is sort of like uh, Saul and David's armor. You remember the story? Uh, uh, David is going to go after Goliath and they try and put Saul's armor on him and he can't even move around. And sometimes I think we make church planting more difficult and complicated because we've got all these ideas about the church I came from and it had these programs and children's programs and all these different uh, features to it. And then we're trying to recreate that somewhere else. But it's like David and Saul's armor. It becomes cumbersome and we make it more difficult. And so we're not necessarily reaching the people effectively. And so we've got to think about what the church is. Now, of course, we can't do a whole systematic theology course here on ecclesiology. So I'm going to just cut straight to the point and um, assume that you will uh, study this on your own and get more depth elsewhere. But um, theologically, we might just simply say the church is a spiritual community of people redeemed by the Son, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and predestined to the glory of the Father. That the church is, at its very core, a spiritual community of believers. They're saved people. They're people who live in the power of the Spirit. They're people who desire to glorify God. Now, that's just a very spiritual definition that gets at the very essence of what the church is about. But that doesn't necessarily help us very much in terms of what the church would look like, practically speaking. That's, that's kind of vague when it comes down to really what a church practically is. And so if we practically want to sort of def define the church, I think a good biblical definition would be this. A fellowship of believers in Jesus Christ committed to gathering regularly for biblical purposes under a recognized spiritual leadership. And each piece of this is really important. And I want to just highlight a couple of points. It's a fellowship of believers in Jesus Christ. Of course, many of us, particularly in Europe or, or so-called Christian countries, we know there's many nominal Christians, people who say, well, yes, I'm a member of a church somewhere and I go once a year to Easter or twice a year if it's Christmas or something like that. Um, but we would say, well, they, they, they might identify themselves as Christians in some way, but they're not genuine believers in Christ. They've not been born again. They've not had a conversion experience where they are true followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so a true church is going to be a church that is composed of believers in Christ. Now, only God can really see the heart, of course. Uh, but by our best judgment, we would say a true church are those who are saved by Christ. They're believers. They're also committed to gathering regularly. Uh, you know, if you have some Christians who live in a city and they get together maybe once a year, uh, well, that would not really constitute a church. The early church, some of them met daily. Um, were, the church was exhorted in Hebrews not to forsake the assembly of believers. It's important that to be a church and not just an individual believer, you're coming together regularly. And of course, you're coming together for biblical purposes. I mean, you could come together to talk about the next football game. You could come together to uh, talk about your favorite hobbies. Uh, you could come together to have some kind of project. But these people are, they're born again, they're believers coming together for biblical purposes. And I won't spell out all those purposes, uh, 
um, we think of many purposes, evangelism, discipleship, edification, service, missions, worship. I mean, there are many different purposes we could put under there to celebrate communion and baptism. Uh, I'm not going to spell all those out, but the reason this group is meeting is for biblical purposes. And then here's an important one. They meet under a recognized spiritual leadership. We'll come back to this in just a minute. But they're not just sort of randomly meeting, but there are leaders who have been appointed by God and approved to give oversight and guidance and uh, spiritual care to that spiritual community. Now, these, each of these elements, as you can see, are very basic. They're quite flexible. You see, we didn't say they had to have a building. We didn't say they have to have a paid pastor who has a full salary and a seminary education. Didn't list any of that. Of course, churches in the New Testament did not have that. Churches in the New Testament didn't have seminaries and buildings and all these kinds of things. That doesn't mean they're bad or wrong. I teach at a seminary. I attend a church with a building. But they're not essential to a biblical definition of the church. Now, that's important, again, because we want to make sure that when we go to start new churches, we're not bringing a lot of extra baggage, a lot of extra ideas and programs that could be a problem. We want that church to fit the context and be flexible so they can reach people and fulfill biblical purposes. Now, if a building helps do that, that's, that's fine, but it may not be necessary. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. And so we'll talk later a little bit about how to understand the community and structuring the church in ways that's appropriate for the people we're reaching. But this is our basic definition that I will be working from. So church planting is going to be that ministry which through evangelism and discipleship establishes reproducing kingdom communities of believers in Jesus Christ who are committed to fulfilling biblical purposes under local spiritual leaders. I've just taken that uh, definition of the church and I've turned it into the definition of church planting. The big difference is I've said it's the ministry through evangelism and discipleship. In other words, uh, many churches grow by church splits. Of course, we don't want to talk about that. You plant new churches by a church having a church split. Uh, but we want to talk about planting churches not by taking believers from other churches so much as planting churches by reaching new people for Jesus Christ and then bringing those people into a committed relationship with Christ in a fellowship that is committed to biblical purposes. And I'll talk about some of these other elements, what kind of churches they are. Again, we don't want to just plant institutions where people meet. We want kingdom communities. And I'll explain that later, but the church that manifests the character of God's kingdom, those are going to be churches that are pleasing to God. And so that is our definition of the church and church planting that we will be working with. 